In this talk, I'd like to discuss viral respiratory tract infections. The respiratory tract can be divided into two parts, the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. I like to use the inferior margin of the larynx as the boundary between the two, though anatomists prefer using the laryngeal inlet and surgeons prefer the thoracic inlet. The upper respiratory tract consists of the nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, pharynx, and larynx, while the lower respiratory tract consists of the trachea, bronchi, and lungs. Sinusitis, pharyngitis, and laryngitis are common upper respiratory tract infections. Typical symptoms of sinusitis include nasal congestion, nasal discharge, facial pain and pressure, and ear pressure. On physical exam, patients with sinusitis may exhibit pain and tenderness on palpation over the involved sinuses, in addition to the presence of perilent nasal fluid, mucosal edema, and inferior turbinate hypertrophy on otoscope exam. The symptoms of pharyngitis are usually sore throat, difficulty swallowing, and neck pain. On physical exam, mucosal edema, conjunctivitis, and enlarged cervical lymph nodes may be present in a patient with pharyngitis. The typical symptoms of laryngitis is hoarseness, and a clinician with a flexible fiber optic bronchoscope in the office might be able to see vocal fold edema in someone with laryngitis. Lower respiratory tract infections consist of bronchitis and pneumonia. Typical symptoms of bronchitis include cough, excessive sputum production, and chest pain caused by all the coughing. Physical exam findings will include ronchi on auscultation that clear with coughing, in addition to wheezing. Symptoms of pneumonia include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. On physical exam, tachypnea, hypoxemia, increased work of breathing, and rails or crackles on auscultation may be present in a patient with pneumonia. So these are, in summary, the symptoms and signs a clinician will use in an office setting when deciding if a patient may have a respiratory tract infection, and if so, which part of the respiratory tract is probably involved. Now, let's talk about what a radiologist may see on a chest x-ray or chest CT in these folks. Let's start with upper respiratory tract infections. We expect essentially no chest x-ray findings in patients with an upper respiratory tract infection. In patients with sinusitis, ear fluid levels may be present on CT images of the paranasal sinuses, however. In patients with pharyngitis, mildly enlarged cervical lymph nodes are the main potential CT finding, though encountering mildly enlarged cervical lymph nodes on a CT is pretty nonspecific, prospectively speaking. Patients with laryngitis will generally have no perceptible imaging findings on CT imaging. With bronchitis, bronchial wall thickening may potentially be visible on chest x-ray, though in my experience, radiologists exhibit pretty low specificity and sensitivity when it comes to prospectively calling bronchial wall thickening on chest x-ray. Most of my subspecialist chest radiology colleagues generally avoid trying to call bronchial wall thickening on chest x-rays for this reason. On chest CT, bronchial wall thickening and endobronchial fluid may be present in patients with bronchitis. Bronchial wall thickening can be a subjective call, and a handy tip I've learned to help me be more objective and consistent is to use the thickness of a normal lung fissure on CT as an internal control of sorts, and to call bronchial wall thickening only when the bronchial wall appears thicker than a normal lung fissure on chest CT. With pneumonia, possible chest x-ray findings may include consolidation, a nodular interstitial pattern, or lung nodules. While on chest CT, pneumonias may present with a couple of patterns, such as consolidation, ground glass opacities, a multi acinar bronchopneumonia pattern, nodules, a central lobular or tree and bud nodular interstitial pattern, or any combination of these. When a patient's symptoms and physical exam suggest an upper respiratory tract infection or bronchitis, imaging will typically not be part of the patient's workup. 
However, if there are symptoms and signs point towards pneumonia, a chest x-ray will typically be part of the workup, and in a few cases, even chest CT. Acute respiratory tract infections can be viral, bacterial, mycobacterial, or fungal infections, and on rare occasions, even parasitic infections. However, viruses are the most common cause. The eight viral respiratory tract infections we most commonly encounter are rhinovirus, influenza, coronavirus, and adenovirus, RNA viruses, and RSV, varicella, HSV type 1, and CMV, DNA viruses. While the modes of rhinovirus, coronavirus, RSV, and varicella transmission can be either airborne or via direct contact, adenovirus can be spread by either airborne or fecal oral routes. Influenza is primarily spread by airborne transmission, while HSV type 1 and CMV are primarily spread by direct contact. Rhinovirus is the number one cause of viral respiratory tract infections. While it's the predominant cause of the common cold, it's also responsible for many lower respiratory tract infections too, including around 10% of adult pneumonias. In fact, rhinovirus is the number one cause of severe pneumonia emissions to many ICUs. Influenza outbreaks occur every winter. Most cases are mild and restricted to the upper respiratory tract. However, some can progress to pneumonia and even lead to complications such as ARDS. Large devastating influenza pandemics have occurred every couple decades, including the Spanish flu during the early 20th century that was responsible for 50 million deaths and the more recent swine flu pandemic in 2009. Coronaviruses are a group of viruses. Many are relatively mild and account for around 15% of the common cold, mostly during winter. However, some coronaviruses can be quite severe, resulting in pneumonia epidemics such as SARS during the early 21st century, MERS about a decade afterwards, and most recently COVID. With um, SARS and MERS, we witnessed mortality rates sometimes as high as 50% in the elderly with MERS, and around 35% with MERS. Adenoviruses are another large family of viruses responsible for a range of different illnesses involving not only the upper and lower respiratory tract, but other organ systems too. Most adenovirus infections are upper respiratory tract infections that peak in the winter. Although adenovirus infections tend to be self-limited in immunocompetent individuals, adenovirus infections can sometimes result in severe or fatal pneumonias in immunocompromised hosts. RSV is the top cause of seasonal pneumonia in infants, and also a top cause of pneumonia requiring hospitalization in children. In addition to the young, RSV may also result in severe pneumonias in the elderly and immunocompromised. Varicella, commonly known as chickenpox, is usually a self-limited infection in children resulting in itchy skin lesions, fever, headaches, and malaise. Adults, however, tend to have a more severe course than children, and complications, the most common being pneumonia, can occasionally occur. HSV type 1 is one of two HSV types, the other of which is HSV type 2 that's associated with genital herpes. Many individuals infected with HSV type 1 are asymptomatic, though some may develop cold sores. In immunocompromised populations, however, HSV type 1 can be a much more serious illness, and pneumonia may occur. CMV. CMV infections usually never produce illnesses in healthy people, but in immunosuppressed populations, such as BMT patients, solid organ transplant recipients, and patients with HIV-AIDS, life-threatening pneumonia can occur. Now that we've introduced you to the pathogens responsible for most viral pneumonias, it's time to talk about how viral pneumonias may appear on imaging. Let's begin with this slide from our pneumonia and lung infections talk. Remember that viral pneumonias, community-acquired pneumonias, 
aspiration pneumonias, and staph pneumonias all can present with the same five patterns on imaging. These ones. So, viral pneumonias can present as ground glass opacities. Ground glass opacities are regional lung opacities that are loosened enough to still permit visualization of the background pulmonary vessels on non-contrast CT. While ground glass opacities are visible on CT, they are not visible on chest x-ray, as demonstrated by the normal appearing left lung on this chest x-ray obtained at the same time as the chest CT we saw on our last slide. So try to avoid using the term ground glass on chest x-ray reports. Viral pneumonias can result in consolidation. In consolidation, air within the air spaces is replaced by fluid, resulting in lung parenchyma that is densely opacified and with preserved volume, unlike, say, atelectasis or fibrosis. With consolidation, background pulmonary vessels will not be discernible on non-contrast imaging. Air bronchograms may sometimes be visible, but air bronchograms are not a specific sign for consolidation or pneumonia, as they can also be seen in other conditions, including atelectasis. Consolidation is visible on both chest CT and on chest X-ray, as you can tell on this chest X-ray image obtained on the same day as a chest CT we just saw on our previous slide. Viral pneumonias can also result in a centrilobular nodular interstitial pattern. Centrilobular nodular interstitial patterns are characterized by numerous tine, tiny, faint, indistinct micronodules that will usually spare the lung margins. While centrilobular nodular interstitial patterns may be perceptible on chest CT, they are usually imperceptible on chest X-ray. Tree and bud nodular interstitial patterns are another way viral pneumonias may present. As the tiny nodules are generally denser and sharper in a tree and bud pattern, in um, more pronounced cases, a tree and bud pattern may even be discernible on chest x-ray as well. Finally, viral pneumonias may present with a multi acinar or bronchopneumonia pattern. This pattern consists of loosely clustered patchy nodular lung opacities that may often appear in a segmental distribution. multi acinar opacity patterns are usually visible on chest x-ray and appear as a heterogeneous opacity with indistinct borders. While viral pneumonias can result in these five different features on imaging, different viral pneumonias tend to have different propensities for these five distinct imaging features. Rhinovirus, coronavirus, and adenovirus pneumonias generally prefer to present as consolidation or ground glass opacities in a multifocal distribution, such as on these cases of rhinovirus pneumonia, SARS pneumonia, and adenovirus pneumonia. Unlike rhinovirus, coronavirus, and adenovirus, influenza, HSV type 1, CMV, and RSV pneumonias may potentially present with any of the five imaging patterns of viral pneumonia. Here's an example of influenza presenting as extensive multifocal consolidation on chest x-ray and extensive multifocal consolidation and ground glass on its matching chest CT. However, here's a different case of influenza that presented as a predominantly tree and bud pattern. Here's a case of HSV type 1 pneumonia presenting as bilateral consolidation and nodular interstitial pattern. Here's a case of RSV pneumonia presenting as isolated ground glass opacities. While this different case of RSV pneumonia exhibited a multi acinar or bronchopneumonia pattern. Finally, Varicella pneumonias, when they occur, generally present, prefer to present as a centrilobular nodular interstitial pattern, tree and bud pattern, or multi acinar bronchopneumonia pattern. This is a chest CT of a patient with varicella pneumonia that presented as a relatively extensive multifocal tree and bud pattern on chest CT. 
Pleural effusions are relatively uncommon in the setting of viral pneumonias, but may occur in the setting of some adenovirus, HSV type 1, and RSV pneumonias. As you can probably tell, not only is imaging of limited specificity if your aim is to distinguish between different types of viral pneumonia, imaging is not that reliable for distinguishing between viral pneumonia and non-viral pneumonias too. So it's important to have a realistic understanding for what the role of imaging actually is with viral pneumonias, which is to help detect viral pneumonias when they occur and to assess their extent or severity. Follow-up imaging can provide us with a window into how well a viral pneumonia may be responding to treatment too. The actual diagnosis of viral pneumonias will rely more heavily on assessing a patient's risk factors, symptoms, physical exam findings, exposures, and environment. However, it may still be difficult to establish which particular virus is to blame since there's quite a lot of overlap between the clinical manifestations of different viral respiratory tract infections. Thankfully, a growing array of viral tests such as these can often give us a pretty good shot at diagnosing viral pneumonias so that we can deliver antivirals to patients in a timely way and avoid or reduce the unnecessary use of antibiotics.